Another 97 people in China have been killed by the coronavirus. We know that over 44,000 people have been infected in China and the death toll is past 1,100. He's the Director General of the World Health Organization. The number of newly confirmed cases reported from China has stabilized over the past week. But that must be interpreted with extreme caution. This outbreak could still go in any direction. Well, outside of China, 25 other countries, all marked in red here, have confirmed cases, and there have been two confirmed deaths. You'll notice, though, no cases in South America, no cases in Africa. It's also worth noting that the daily rate of infection is falling by almost 50% since last week. On that issue, here's the BBC's Stephen McDonnell in Beijing. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves because, uh, I mean, if people became complacent, all of a sudden it could take off again. But for the moment, at, at least there is some, some sort of a suggestion that we might be turning the road. But until we're seeing, for example, tens of thousands of people in the recovered column, well, that then people will start to feel a bit better then. Development, the Mobile World Congress event in Barcelona, a vast industry event, has been cancelled because of the coronavirus. Also, the Chinese Grand Prix, which was due to take place in Shanghai in April, well, that's been postponed. Formula One says the decision's been made to ensure the health and safety of drivers, staff and fans. Also, in Geneva, scientists have been gathering at the World Health Organization to discuss ways to combat this virus. Here's the analysis of one of them. The measures that China has taken to really contain the outbreak might work. And so it might end up as, as uh, an outbreak that, of course, unfortunately has killed over a thousand people, but can still be controlled and contained. On the other hand, we don't know. It might have already spread outside to many countries. And so this may become still a global outbreak or even a pandemic. Let's bring in the BBC's Imogen Fuchs, who's been covering these discussions in Switzerland. Um, Imogen, what are the goals of these talks? What's the hope of the WHO by bringing all these scientists together? Well, they went into these two days saying that they wanted to draft a kind of master plan aimed at containing and, in the end, stopping this virus. A twin track, though, at the same time preparing countries for its arrival. And at the end of uh, those two days, just this evening, in fact, they highlighted various things that they want to do. And almost top of the list is getting easy to use diagnostic kits to countries with weaker, weaker uh, health infrastructure. That bears into the clip you just played there, that there are no cases, registered cases in Africa. But as the WHO expert said there, it could be that there are cases, but there's been uh, no chance to really diagnose them. So that's one of the things that WHO wants to do. Also, look at treatments. There's no specific treatment for this, this virus yet. And in the long term, look at vaccines. So they got a plan for all of that. And I think boosted a bit by this news that the cases, daily new cases in China are falling, a hint of stabilization, but nobody, really nobody is getting complacent at the WHO in Geneva. But Imogen, what's the relationship between the WHO and the individual countries caught up in this? Because presumably the WHO can't mandate a particular response from a particular country. No, it can't. But, you know, the, the, the World Health Organization is a UN body and it has over 190 member states. So all the countries on the planet. Um, these member states have signed up to this uh, body of regulations called the International Health Regulations, which means they are obliged, for example, to inform when they come across a case. The WHO is not a body, and I think it understands maybe that it doesn't work, it's not a body to go out there swinging a big stick and saying you must do this, because the last thing anybody wants is for a country to feel frightened or bullied even, and therefore hide cases. One of the things we know that China was very worried about was, you know, revealing these cases and the effect it might have on its economy. It's gone ahead and it's cooperating, as far as we hear in Geneva, ex in an extremely transparent way with the World Health Organization. Still a huge, uh, a huge hit to its economy. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something countries have to face and it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, balancing act.
Evergen, we appreciate the update. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the largest coronavirus outbreak outside mainland China is not in a country as such. It's on a cruise ship that's docked close to Yokohama in Japan. Here it is. It's called the Diamond Princess. 175 people on board have the virus. That includes a health official who boarded to hand out questionnaires and then became infected. And in total, there are over 3,500 passengers and crew on this ship. None of them are being allowed to get off. And Japan saying it doesn't even have the capacity to treat all of them. Well, the BBC has been speaking to one American passenger who's stuck on board. We're good little prisoners. We stay in our rooms and just go out on the balcony. We put our trash out in the appropriate way. We pick up our messages outside the door. We wear our masks when we open the door for our food trays. We certainly look forward to the food like any prisoner. And uh, this is the poshest penitentiary there is. The food has gotten significantly better. It's very healthy. We have three choices for our meals now at lunch and dinner. Somebody told me that we're the worst cluster of disease outside of China. And I, I don't want to be a part of any cluster of disease. I'm sure she doesn't, but unfortunately she is. It is the worst cluster of the coronavirus outside mainland China. For more on the situation with this ship, here's the BBC's Tokyo correspondent, Rupert Wingfield Hayes. The, the numbers on board that ship continue to climb quite fast. Uh, 39 new cases today. And there are around 3,700 people quarantined on board the ship. They're going to have to stay on board, we understand, at least for another week. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're stuck in their cabins. Uh, there is concern about uh, the condition of many elderly people uh, on board that ship. Uh, and there have been calls by some people to either screen everybody on that ship or take them off the ship and move them somewhere else. But the Japanese government so far is absolutely refusing to do that. Now, another cruise ship's also caught up in this story. This one is in Hong Kong. It also has over 3,500 passengers, all of whom are quarantined, even though none of them had been diagnosed. You can see a picture of it here. The difference with Japan is that all the passengers on this boat were tested and then allowed to disembark. There's then a third cruise ship, which is also part of this crisis. It's been turned away from several ports in Asia. We now expect it to dock in Cambodia. Here it is. We talked about it yesterday. It's called the Westerdam. It was due to arrive with around 1,500 passengers sometime on Thursday. We'll see if that happens. The owner of the ship says there's nothing to suggest anyone on board has the virus. That, though, didn't stop Thailand and others turning it away. All of which raises the question, does something particular happen on cruise ships if there are viruses? And the BBC's done a whole analysis of this. The headline reads, are cruise ships really floating Petri dishes? And you can find the whole analysis at bbc.com slash news. Well, from Cambodia now on to Singapore, because around 300 employees there had to be evacuated from the country's biggest bank. That was after one person became ill with the virus. You can see an image here from the 43rd floor of the DBS bank. That's the floor where the staff were evacuated from. Let's get more from Sharanjit Lail in Singapore. Now, the bank released a statement saying that it would be providing the employee who fell ill and his family with every support and guidance. Now, Singapore, of course, raised its disease outbreak response system condition to orange last week, which uh, essentially means the disease is severe and spreads easily from person to person. Now, the city's Ministry of Health has just confirmed as well today three more cases, bringing the total to 50. Uh, most of them, I should add, in stable condition. Uh, 15 others, in fact, have recovered and actually been discharged, though eight, we're told, are still in critical condition. Then there's Hong Kong. On Tuesday, health officials, you can see some of them here, were partially evacuating the tower block, which reaches up from this point, because of fears the virus was being spread through the building's pipes. On that, here's Nick Beek. The reason why they're so concerned about this particular tower block was the experience they had 17 years ago with the SARS virus, which was able to spread very, very quickly through one particular place where more than 300 people became infected. The latest we're getting is that maybe that was more a, a precaution and actually five people who appeared to have some form of flu, they had a fever, they have tested negative for the coronavirus. Well, as concern over the virus grows, a video game that teaches players about how diseases spread has grown very, very popular in China. The company that makes the game, Plague Inc., 
is now warning people to seek information on the disease from official sources rather than relying on its game. This clip gives you an idea of what it looks like. Rather alarmingly, its aim is to infect everybody with your disease and then eventually wipe out the whole world, which evidently isn't the approach we're looking for with this crisis. It also saw a jump in sales during the 2014 Ebola outbreak, and players from around the world are able to donate to charities which actually help combat the spread of infectious diseases. Now, here in the UK, another case of the virus has been confirmed. It's believed to be a woman who flew into London from China. That brings the total number of cases in the UK to nine, and efforts are continuing to trace 12 patients who were treated by two British doctors who've since been diagnosed with the coronavirus. One of them works here in a hospital in Worthing in South England, the others in Brighton on the south coast of England. Both are now being treated in isolation. This is one expert's view on what could come next for the virus in the UK. Our best estimates are really the transmission will get going in the UK in the next few weeks unless we're very lucky, probably peak in two or three months after that. Um, it has to be borne in mind the epidemic in Wuhan is peaking at the moment, but it's been going for three months since the beginning of December. We have no real idea what's going on in the rest of China. Well, for the latest on the situation in the UK, here's our health correspondent, Catherine Burns. We know that when most people get this, they don't become very ill. Their symptoms tend to be very mild. In terms of actually stopping the virus, experts say we could be looking by the end of the year before we get some kind of vaccine. But they think this virus has a weakness. It likes us to be close together. So there are precautions that we can take, and there really are the kind of things that you would take to stop yourself getting any kind of bug. Wash your hands. Try not to touch your face too often. If you cough or sneeze, make sure you cover your mouth. Really, it's a case of using our common sense. This is only the fifth time that the World Health Organization has declared a public health emergency of international concern. But it's still not exactly clear how contagious or how deadly this particular coronavirus is. The definition of a public health emergency is an extraordinary event that carries implications for public health beyond the affected state's national border, so in this case China. The coronavirus is also being defined as an epidemic. That's when an illness or disease affects a specific region. Health experts say it could become a pandemic. That would be the worldwide spread of a disease. So far, coronavirus cases have been confirmed in 26 countries, but that's out of 195 covered by the World Health Organization. We should also note that the virus isn't spreading very much in countries outside of China. The majority of global cases are people who have been infected in China. And we still don't really know how deadly this virus is. The mortality rate is being estimated at 2%, but that's likely to be an overestimate because it's certain that many people have been infected but haven't suffered severe enough symptoms to attend hospitals, so their cases are not being recorded. And just for comparison, seasonal flu typically has a mortality rate of 1%. SARS, which was a similar viral outbreak in 2003, had a death rate of over 10%. And around 35% of reported patients who had Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, known as MERS, well, 35% died during an outbreak in 2012. Well, here's the latest update on what we're calling COVID-19 from the WHO. I think we have to be very cautious. Uh, the the, the stabilisation in cases in, 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 in the last number of days uh, is very reassuring, as the DG has said. And it is, uh, to a great extent, the result of the huge public health operation uh, in China. Um, it is very hard, though, to predict. Uh, uh, we definitely see uh, that the behaviour of the virus uh, outside, outside Wuhan, Hubei, in the rest of China, and outside China, uh, doesn't appear at this point to be as aggressive or as accelerated. And that's a good sign. And that gives us an opportunity to, to prepare and to react, and still gives us the opportunity for containment and potential interruption of transmission of the virus. Uh, but that's no guarantee. Now, this is interesting. It's a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association we've spotted. It looks at a hospital in Wuhan, which, of course, is the city at the center of this outbreak. This study found that just over half of all people affected by the virus were adults between the ages of 40 and 59. Only 10 percent were patients younger than 39. And it goes on to conclude, um, if I just bring up a quote here, 
Cases in children have been rare. The same pattern was seen in outbreaks of the SARS and MERS viruses. Now, there is one possible explanation. This is Natalie McDermott, a clinical lecturer at University College London, saying children over the age of five and teenagers tend to have immune systems that are quite primed for fighting viruses. Natalie goes on, they may still be infected, but could have much milder disease or not display symptoms of infection. So that's some of what we know and we don't know. Here's the World Health Organization on the importance of getting accurate information out to the public. Since the outbreak COVID-19 started, we are also facing an infodemic, as we said, an overflow of information, uh, which is trusted sometimes, but sometimes it's also misinformation. So it makes hard for people then to understand who should they trust or where, where they can find reliable information. That's why here in WHO we are trying to maximize the power of digital communications and in particular social media to ensure as many people as possible around the world and in China are um, actually uh, receiving reliable information on how to protect themselves from getting sick um, and um, also on what's, uh, how the outbreak is, is evolving and how the response uh, is going. There's a lot of fear. So it's not necessarily always the misinformation, it's also misunderstanding and rumors that are spreading. So we're also trying to address these and regularly update everything what we see in media or social media. Um, we use then evidence-based responses and publish them on our website and social media. Just to give you a sense of some, uh, there, is, there, there were some rumors, if I spray alcohol over my body, am I protected from the virus? the response is no and explanation is given or uh, if I do if I use a hand dryer does that mean that the virus will be killed from my hands the response is no we need to regularly to wash hands with soap and water etc etc so this issue of misinformation is crucial as part of this crisis here's the WHO's director general on this outbreaks can bring out the best <coughs> and the worst in people <coughs> Stigmatizing individuals or entire nations does nothing but harm the response. Instead of directing all our energy against the outbreak, the stigma diverts our attention and turns people against each other. I will say it again. This is a time for solidarity, not stigma. And there's much more information on the virus on the BBC News website.